Hello there. My name is Kofi Makinwa. I'm a professor at Delft University of Technology. And today I will be talking to you about a somewhat mysterious technique known as chopping. Now, first of all, what's chopping all about? I'm sure you've heard about it because chopping is a technique that's used a lot in analog circuits these days. You may have heard some good stuff, like its almost magical ability to reduce offset one of F noise and drift. But you probably have heard some bad stuff about the way it creates switching spikes, chopper ripple, and other kinds of unwanted artifacts. The aim of this talk is to um, bring you up to speed with chopping and help you understand how it works, and in particular, about its pros and cons. So, at the heart of the chopping technique lies a simple component known as a chopper. Now, a chopper, that's just a fancy word for a polar polarity reversing switch. As such, a chopper, you can see that in the center of, the, of, your, of your slides, um, is able to multiply an analog input signal, like V in, by plus one or minus one. And because we can realize switches pretty uh, ideally in CMOS technology, basically a chopper gives us the possibility of making a near perfect square wave modulator. Okay, so we have a near perfect square wave modulator, but what, are, what can we do with it? Well, we can use it to build a chopper amplifier. And that's what you see on this slide, a block diagram of a chopper amplifier. Um, you see it's an amplifier, and there's a square, a square wave modulator in front of it, and a, a square wave modulator at its output. Now, let's look at what happens to an input signal. An input signal, V in, the, v in, in this case, drawn in black, passes through the first square wave modulator and gets turned into a square wave. The square wave gets amplified, becoming a larger square wave, and then it hits the second modulator and actually gets demodulated back to DC. The DC signal goes through this low-pass filter and appears as a DC signal at output. So from the, from the point of view of the input signal, this um, um, circuit behaves like an amplifier. You put in a small DC signal and you get a larger DC, DC signal at output. But let's look at what happens to the amplifier's offset. The key point to note is that the amplifier's offset is going to get amplified, and it's only going to be uh, modulated once. So the red offset is, becomes bigger at the output of the amplifier, gets turned into a square wave by the second modulator, and that square wave um, um, signal will be filtered out by the low-pass filter. If we look at this block diagram, and now understanding how it works, basically you, what we see is the input signal that goes through, it gets modulated twice, appears relatively unchanged at the output of the amplifier, the offset gets modulated once, gets turned into a square wave, and the square wave ripple gets filtered out. Just looking from this simple block diagram, we can already make a few interesting observations. First of all, if the input duty cycle, if the, if the chopping duty cycle is not exactly 50%, then we, will, we can immediately see that there's going to be some residual offset because this red square wave is going to have a DC component. So it's important that the chopping waveform have an exact 50% duty cycle. And the way we do this is usually by using an on-chip flip-flop. To give you an example, give you some numbers, if the offset is, was, of the amplifier was one millivolt and we are chopping it at 50 kilohertz, and there's one, just one nanosecond of clock skew, already that will give us a residual offset of 100 nanovolts. So it's something to pay attention to. Another insight that we gain looking at this block diagram is that there is a low-pass filter at the output of this chopper amplifier, and that represents a fundamental loss of bandwidth. So that's something that's fundamentally associated with the chopping technique. And because no low-pass filter is perfect, when you apply a square wave, to, the, to, to, to an imperfect low-pass filter, there will always be a small amount of residual ripple at the output of the chopper amplifier. And that's also something that you have to watch out for because you have to design the low-pass filter and choose the chopping frequency in order for this ripple to be negligible. 
Another thing that we can see from, from this block diagram, remember I said a chopper, a chopper is basically a collection of switches. Now, these switches will have a certain on resistance and therefore a certain amount of thermal noise. So that's also something to keep in mind. And last but not least, the amplifier is now processing signals at the chopping frequency. So actually its effective gain is, not, is no longer its DC gain, it's its gain at the chopping frequency, which will typically be less than its DC gain. All right, so that was looking at choppers in the time domain. But we can gain some more insights by looking at chopping in the frequency domain. So here's a diagram showing our hopefully um, recognizable chopper amplifier. But let's look at and see what's happening in the frequency domain. Now there's the input signal, and we've depicted it as a baseband signal, low frequency signal. And it goes through the first chopper and gets modulated up to the harmonics of the square wave. And that's what you see over here. Now this signal gets amplified, and then it hits the demodulator and the, the, all the energy of the harmonics gets converted back to baseband. So that's all good. But look, let's look what happens to the offset. The offset and one of F noise gets modulated once. So what happens to the offset of one of F noise? It, at the output of the chop amplifier, just before the low pass filter, we find that it has been upmodulated to harmonics of the square wave. And now you can see in the frequency domain how the magic happens. What's happening is that if you strategically design your low-pass filter, so it follows this red characteristic, all the energy at the harmonics of the square wave will be completely filtered out, but your input signal will remain. And looking at this diagram, we can immediately see that the, that the critical uh, um, design criteria is that the chopping frequency should be greater than one, or, one over F corner frequency of your system. Chopper amplifiers are not perfect. And one of their fundamental imperfections is that they will exhibit some kind of residual offset. And what's the main cause for that residual offset, apart from the duty cycle, which I've, talking, which I've spoken to you about, is the fact that this chopper switches over here will generate spikes. And the square wave control signal will couple capacitively to the input lines of your amplifier. Now, if there's any imperfection associated with these processes, there will be um, input spikes present at the input of your amplifier. And just like the offset, they're going to be amplified by the amplifier and will be demodulated by the output chopper. And if you look at this diagram carefully, you will see that this, modul this demodulation is equivalent to rectification. And therefore, this spike waveform will have a certain DC component. And that translates to residual offset. It's also interesting to note that because these spikes are occurring at the input of the amplifier, a chopper amplifier, despite the fact that it's made in CMOS, will have a finite input current. Can we do something about this? Well, again, we look at the, our diagram and try and derive some insights we can see that the amount of residual offset is going to be proportional to the chopping frequency because the more frequently these spikes come along, the larger the DC component will be. So as a design principle, we want to keep our chopping frequency as low as possible. At the same time, of course, making sure that it's higher than one of, one of the F corner frequency. We can also see that the residual offset, or including the input current, will be proportional to the spike amplitude. So we want the spikes to be small. So that means we should use small switches, subject to noise considerations, and we should take great care in the layout of our clock lines to make sure that they all couple symmetrically to the input of our amplifier. And if we do everything correctly, we can get residual offsets as low as 1 to 10 microvolts and input currents that are in the order of 10 to 100 picoamps. Another drawback of a chopper amplifier, one that's often overlooked, is the fact that the input capacitance of an amplifier will actually uh, result in a switched capacitor resistor. How does that work? Well, let's look at this diagram over here. I'm, sh I'm showing the two phases of, our ch of, 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 the ch of the input chopper. 
So in one phase, the input voltage is applied across the capacitor to generate this red voltage. But as soon as the chopper switches things around, you will see that the input voltage gets flipped and therefore the capacitor has to be charged to the opposite voltage. And who supplies the current? That's the input source. So actually, this cycle of inverting the voltage applied to the input capacitance actually causes, requires a certain amount of input current and therefore uh, corresponds to an input impedance with a value of 1 divided by 4 times the chopping frequency times the input capacitance. To put some uh, numbers on this, if you have an input capacitance of 100 femtofarad and you're chopping at 50 kilohertz, which is quite typical, already this will give you an effective input impedance of 50 mega ohm. And a little thing, uh, maybe a more advanced topic, is the fact that because you have a finite input impedance now, and you have these input spikes generating current, actually a chopper amplifier is also associated with a certain amount of current noise. And uh, this topic is uh, covered uh, much more in detail in the reference that you can see on the slide. All right, so I'm giving you the background of chopping. These are the key things to look out for, residual offset, input impedance, input current, loss of um, bandwidth, um, finite gain, and so on. Let's see how you would actually use a chopper. So here's a, a, a chopped transconductor that is, I'm showing here because it's very popular. It's used in a lot of circuits. And it's basically a folded cast code amplifier, but now it's chopped. You see you recognize the input chopper, at the input of the amplifier, and then you will notice that the um, output chopper is a PMOS chopper, and um, I have an extra NMOS chopper down here. Key features of this topology is that it's fully differential, which means that the choppers will generate matched spikes, which will give you low spike mismatch and therefore low offset. You also may, uh, will notice that the output choppers are actually chopping currents in the output branch of the folded cascode amplifier, which means that the bandwidth is quite large for the, chopping, uh, for the chopped signals, and therefore we maintain a high effective gain. Also, the choppers are pretty close to the rails, so they are easy to drive. And last but not least, that extra NMOS chopper I told you about is going to actually chop the offset and 1 over F noise of the NMOS current sources. So that's a kind of like a bonus. Well, that's basically all I want to tell you about chopper amplifiers today, but let's wrap it up. In summary, chopping, four switches, or eight switches, that can turn you from zero to hero. There, but it's not a free lunch. There are some pros and there are definitely some cons. The pros, with chopping you can completely eliminate drift and one of F noise. And offset can be made very, very low. In fact, people have reported offsets in the order of 100 nanovolts. But there are some cons. There's a fundamental low-pass filtering associated with chopping, which limits bandwidth. But it turns out that by using more advanced topologies, we can simultaneously obtain low offset and wide bandwidth. And some examples can be found in the references included. Because offset is basically being upmodulated to high frequencies, there's always going to be a certain amount of chopper ripple. And dealing with that effectively does demand some extra filtering and maybe some additional circuit complexity. And again, but that is something that we've learned how to do over the last 20 years, and there are a number of examples of different ways of, do, of doing this in the references that I've shown uh, below. So to wrap it up, I would say chopping is a very effective technique. It works great, and I hope that by listening to this talk, I've given you some extra insights so you'll know how to use it and make it work for you. Thank you very much for listening.